They came out of nowhere to plunder and murder, from the shores of Scotland to the Caspian Sea. Modern archaeology and science reveal for the first time the real driving forces behind the Viking raids from the Russian plains to the North Atlantic. While Viking enthusiasts of today live the life of the Scandinavian warriors and fight set-piece battles at the festival of Volin, scientists and archaeologists from all over Europe are making groundbreaking discoveries. Recent research shows the Vikings from a new perspective and in the brutal social context of their time, spotlighting their incredible ability to plan and execute their expeditions for maximum profit and psychological effect. At the time when the Vikings attacked, there was starvation in England. There were dragons in the sky when the Vikings came. It was like a part of the punishment from God. They'd been pushed into the top of a ditch and they'd been very seriously traumatized at death. Their, their bodies were very hacked about, legs, arms, missing. The vertebral, second vertebral body, uh, body indicates uh, decapitation marks, as you see. There's a clean cut through uh, cervical spine to here. The story of the Vikings takes us to Saarema Island in Estonia. Here, a team of archaeologists from Tallinn excavated an amazing cache of Viking artifacts that turned the history of these Scandinavian pirates on its head. Yuri Peets excavated one of the most impressive Viking burial sites known to experts today. The remains of more than 40 human skeletons in two boat graves were unearthed in 2011 during road construction. We can say for sure that it was a battle grave and that there was a sort of big battle, I mean 40 bodies in two ships, that says it all. The battle had to be hard. We can see vicious wounds on the skeletons. Some, for example, have hacked hands and broken skulls. So it was hard, and they had to bury those victims fast. Tallinn researcher Riley Alme is studying bones of the Sarema warriors and how they died. The skeletons all showed signs of violent deaths and multiple battle wounds. Uh, the upper arm has cut into four pieces. There are more than four cuts into the bone. Um, the hand position or upper arm position could have been some like, like that because some of the strokes are in the same direction, in the same angle, and then the position has changed. When the team from Tallinn applied modern dating techniques to the skeletons, they were shocked by what they found. Analysis of the items we found, including the skeletons and the organic material, shows they go back to pre-Viking times. Incredibly, the ships and the bodies date back to at least 100 years before the first recorded Viking raid. Yet the weapons, the shape of the ship and artifacts buried with them prove that the men found in the two boat graves came from Scandinavia. These 40 bodies show that Vikings were raiding at least a century earlier than scholars previously believed. We can be sure that these men were Scandinavian sailors who somehow met their death at Salme. As we shall see, the Viking Age was one of incredible brutality and the ferocious battle that raged on the beach of Sarema 
must have been major if 40 warriors were hacked to pieces and then respectfully buried by their comrades. Uh, I think that during battle uh, he fell down. He was attacked from, the, from behind and um, maybe he fell down. Uh, he was fighting probably because the cuts are in, the, in his right upper arm. But in my opinion, this um, upper arm or the hand was somehow fixed because you cannot make the um, strokes like this, that they are in the same angle, more or less. And um, finally, I found this um, Kalkanes, um, one of the bones in the foot, I show you, <laughs> um, which also means that he should have been lying or something because the hit is somewhere here. And uh, of course the final has been this decapitation, in my opinion. Archaeological evidence in Russia confirms that Vikings raided, but also traded, along the great rivers of Eastern Europe at least as early as the mid-8th century. Adrian Salin is a researcher in early Russian history at St. Petersburg University, Russia. No one knew what was in ancient Russia. Everyone knew that somewhere around the Caspian Sea they were minting silver coins and that they could be exported to the rest of Europe in unimaginable quantities. And it was this area between the Baltic and the Caspian Seas, along the Volga River, that was the first to be colonized by Scandinavians. Here at Staria Ladaga, on the shores of the Volkov River, tree ring dating of wooden objects such as this stick carved with letters of the Viking alphabet called runes shows that Scandinavian traders and warriors appeared here long before any mention of Vikings in the written chronicles. With regards to Staria Ladoga, we can see that Scandinavian artifacts, dating back to before the Viking Age, have been found in the oldest of all the sites in the area of Staria Ladoga. The ancient chronicles known as sagas and runic inscriptions in Scandinavia have given a name to these men whose exploits went unrecorded for centuries before they slashed their way into the history books. They were the Vikings. They were men and women who left the safety of their homes to explore and plunder distant lands, from modern-day Poland, Ukraine and Russia, to the islands of the North Atlantic and as far as America. The Vikings spread not only terror, but also a web of trade. The mystery of where the Vikings came from and why they attacked has now been revealed. Scandinavian warriors had begun plundering coastlines of the Baltic Sea and Atlantic Ocean early in the 7th century. By the end of the 8th century, they had occupied the northernmost of the British Isles plundered Scotland and dispossessed the indigenous population, the Picts, whose monuments still stand on Orkney today. Well, I'm sure initially people came here trading and that would have been the first contact and the first contact would certainly have, have been on that level and they would have been finding out what it was like in Shetland as a result of, of that. However, and you get objects appearing in the Pictish um, context showing that kind of link. The degree to which it did or didn't become aggressive, um, we don't really know. Here at Jarlshof on Shetland, the way the Vikings reused Pictish dwellings is clearly visible. What happened to the locals remains a mystery. Sometime in the 8th century, Warriors from Norway came here, and the Pictish culture disappeared. The term Viking really only applies to the very first settlers who came, who were in that initial uh, exploratory, possibly raiding phase, 
which maybe in Shetland perhaps only lasted as much as a generation. I don't think it's as black and white as either you were a raider and a pirate or you were a farmer and um, had your own industry or soapstone industry or whatever it was that you did. I'm sure that all these roles were mixed up together and it's not clear cut. The Vikings probably used hit and run tactics to raid coastal and riverside communities in Scotland and Ireland for decades before they attacked a monastery in northern England where they found more gold than they could imagine. But they did not come for plunder alone. A titanic struggle was underway, pitting the Christian empire of Charlemagne against the last pagans of Europe. The holy island of Lindisfarne is cut off from land during high tides. Today, tourists flock here for the seabirds. Monks first came here because it was isolated. In the distance, the Northumbrian castle of Bamburgh was close enough for the holy men to exert religious influence and receive protection. No one expected the vicious attack of the 8th of June 793. Chronicler Alcuin of York commented, Behold, the church of St. Cuthbert, spattered with the blood of the priests of God, despoiled of all its ornaments, a place more venerable than all in Britain, is given as a prey to pagan peoples. Alcuin of York, however, was far away in Aachen the capital city of the greatest empire of Europe, ruled by Charlemagne, champion of the Christians. Charlemagne's drive northwards and the 30-year-long forcible conversion of the Saxons to Christianity brought his empire to the very edges of pagan Denmark. Inevitably, Christian chroniclers were the sworn enemies of the pagan Vikings. But according to Marit Vea, the lead archaeologist at the royal palace at Orvaldsnes, Norway, the pagans may have been reacting to Christian atrocities. At that time, Charlemagne was conquering territory after territory in Europe. And Charlemagne's war, well, his culture minister was Alcuin. He had been to Lindisfarne Monastery, for instance. The first attack known to us was at Lindisfarne Monastery. So one theory is that the raid was a response to Charlemagne's aggression. We shall see that Viking raids became invasions when politics in Scandinavia and in the great kingdoms of Europe created opportunities for attack. The raids were planned to strike when the enemy was weakest and the potential for plunder the greatest. Charlemagne died in 815 AD, and 30 years later, his grandsons began a civil war that set three Frankish armies against each other. The opportunity to attack and pillage into the heart of the empire was too great to be missed. The great river Seine flows into the English Channel and leads all the way to Paris. In 841, Danish Viking Asgir sailed up it with 13 ships, less than a thousand men, and burned down the city of Rouen. He went on up the river to the magnificent monastery of Jumiège, where he ransomed the monks. The Vikings stayed for the winter and ravaged the countryside the next year too. In 845, the city of Paris itself was looted by a certain Ragnar. The Viking raids continued for the next 30 years. The Vikings avoided facing the Franks in battle, but more often they were paid either to leave or to fight each other, or serve as mercenaries. They were also given land in the northern Netherlands and in the Rhine estuary in exchange for their military services. We can't ignore the shock and the violence, but nor can we see the relations between the Scandinavians and the Franks and other peoples as only this. 
There were also other types of relationship, including trade relations, as well as other relations, such as discussions, negotiations, exchanges. When they found resistance in France, the Vikings turned to England, which was little more than a patchwork of weak kingdoms. Bambara was the seat of one of the Northumbrian kings, and Northumbria was just one of four kingdoms in England at the time. Northumbria stretched from the Scottish border to the Humber River, just south of York. It was divided into two sub-kingdoms, constantly at war with each other, while the middle of England was occupied by Mercia. The kingdoms of East Anglia and Wessex occupied the east and west of the country. Divided and mutually hostile, they were unable to put up resistance to what initially was little more than a Viking nuisance. The part-time warriors of the English kingdoms were no match for the determined Viking predators. In 865, the four leaders of the great heathen army, Ivar, Halfdan, Obba and Guthrum, landed in East Anglia and began a 20-year reign of terror. They captured York on All Saints' Day, when both rival kings of Northumbria were celebrating the Christian festivity. They practiced the blood eagle torture on one of the kings after killing the other in battle, and marched on to conquer the rest of England. York became a Viking capital for a century, but what the history books tell us isn't always backed up by archaeology, says Peter Connolly, the director of the excavations in the Hungate quarter of the city. We talk about the archaeology of York as being Anglo-Scandinavian, so you have the Anglo-Saxon aspect and that Scandinavian aspect, and it's very difficult to tease those apart. So it, it already looks like we're dealing with a, a, a more cosmopolitan um, population than, say, the historical records would you know, lead us to believe. The Jorvik Center at Coppergate in York holds significant artifacts of Scandinavian origin, such as combs, which were a typical male adornment. But also this Saxon helmet was found in a well, while these boards from a Saxon ship were found as walls in a Viking storehouse in the Hungate area. After terrorizing the rest of Northern England, Ivor captured Repton, an important religious and political center in Mercia. This pond at the back of Repton School and below the churchyard is what is left of the Tyne River dock at the Viking fortress. Here in the churchyard, 250 skeletons, mostly male, were found gathered around a central grave dated to 873 by a Saxon coin. It was the year Ivor died. Nearby, at Heath Wood, hundreds of small tumuli suggest that this was the Viking military cemetery. In the same year, one of the other Viking leaders, Halfdan, raided into Scotland, but left some of his warriors to build farms. The Vikings were here to stay. But despite what the Christian chroniclers wrote, the impact on the tiny population of England was relatively imperceptible. We're not talking a massive population. Hundreds of thousands, um, say for the, the north of England into Scotland, but I'd be very surprised if anybody estimated um, upwards of a million. Alfred, King of Wessex, the only Saxon kingdom to survive the Scandinavian onslaught, defeated a second invading Viking army at Ashdown. But the campaigns continued for nearly 20 years, with the Vikings drawing on help from Ireland, where Ivar's sons had settled. The great heathen army campaigned tirelessly and almost successfully until the last surviving leader, Guthrum, was defeated by Alfred in 878 and signed a pact to be baptized. A vast area of England that came to be known as Danelaw would be ruled by Vikings in York. The peace did not last, however, as Viking bands from France and Ireland also joined in the fray 
in the following years. As we shall see, events in Norway and Denmark continued to influence the patterns of raiding. Alfred's military reforms left Wessex better equipped to fight the raiders. He instituted the first standing army in England and a series of fortress towns known as Burrs, where the rural population could seek refuge when under attack. England's renewed administrative efficiency assured the loyalty of the local population. The, the sort of many sort of glances across to the to Anglo-Saxon England is because of its um, well advanced uh, taxation system. Um, and um, there are ways of levering um, people um, out of the land and, and that obviously comes with the fact that um, you get this trickle-down effect from the, the, the central power, um, call it a king, um, to the way that land is given out. That benefaction um, buys loyalty. Scotland, too, continued to be subject to attacks by Viking bands. In 871, Ivor joined a Viking army from Ireland to capture Dumbarton Castle, an isolated British settlement in the heart of Pictish, Scotland. The population was enslaved and sent to Ireland. On the east coast of Scotland, the Vikings attacked Donata Castle too, just over the border with Northumbria in the year 900, when the Pictish king Domna was killed. Although the great heathen army had disappeared, the raids by other leaders, especially from Scotland and Ireland, continued, creating new states, such as the new kingdom of Strathclyde, famous for its stone carving school. In Denmark and Norway, the territorial expansion of new ruling dynasties pushed nobles who refused to be subdued to seek their fortunes abroad. The richer the plunder, the more they invested in ships and men to mount ever larger attacks. Each Norwegian valley had its own king, until the ruler of this strategic strait along Norway's coastline used his financial power to subdue those lords. In 870, Harald Fairhair began building the first kingdom of Norway, from here at Orvaldnes on Kamoe Island. What is certain is that all of Harald Fairhair's royal estates were located in Rogaland and Hordaland. And even though all other places were ruled on Harald Fairhair's behalf, he himself only had the full control in these two counties. What was happening in the Viking heartland affected the extent of the Viking raids in the east and west. The Viking onslaught against England and the Frankish lands was driven by politics as well as by lust for plunder. Opponents to Harold, those who saw no profit in paying tribute to him and serving as soldiers in his army, may have taken to raiding and exploring the North Atlantic instead. The hundreds of fjords were perfect places to hide, and plundering the rich coastlines of England and the Frankish Empire or sailing to Iceland must have seemed more attractive than serving this upstart. Danish chieftains served as mercenaries for the warring Frankish kings and were invited to occupy Frisia, opening the way to attacks further down the continental coastline. They brought home not only plunder, but also ambitions to rule as kings in their own homelands. In 947, Politics in Norway led to strife in England. Defeated by his English-educated brother, Harold Fairhair's son, Eric Bloodaxe, found refuge among the Scandinavians of York. The nobles of Northumbria rebelled against their new Saxon king, Adred, and elected Eric king in his place at Ripon Cathedral. Adred reacted mercilessly and ordered the cathedral burned terrifying the rebellious nobles into surrender. The Norwegian Viking was killed in battle after a second attempt to gain the throne. So if we think about Eric Bloodaxe, he is disposed 
um, of the, the, the king of the area uh, in 954 AD. And it's around about 960 into the 970s that we see a whole new suite of development in Hungate. The area Hungate is, is in Jorvik now, it really is ex expanding past it. And that then continues right through into the 11th century. We have to bear in mind how Scandinavian societies developed. They themselves were the result of interaction with outside societies. But this too is subject to debate because we can't imagine that all the stimulus for evolution comes from outside, as has been said. But there were developments within Scandinavian society too. Swedish raiders dominated the Baltic Sea from Lake Malaren and the islands of Gotland and Öland. These two large islands with their vast coastlines were perfect bases for raiders into Central and Eastern Europe and a halfway house for the markets of Hedeby and Birka. The market towns filled with goods plundered from the plains of Eastern Europe and stolen from the cities of the West. A large number of treasures found on the islands of Öland and Gotland, now on exhibition in the Stockholm Museum, show how profitable trade and plunder was and how even from the earliest times, the Vikings sought the most transportable wealth available at the time, bronze, silver and gold. They sold or stole furs, walrus ivory, amber and slaves. The Vikings had been raiding and trading along the rivers of Central and Eastern Europe for centuries before their first raid was recorded in the West. As far as I know, today the widespread belief is that the appearance of the Vikings in Eastern Europe is linked to their interest in silver that goes back to the 9th century. Between the 800s and 900s, so in the 9th century, several million silver dirhams were exported from the Caspian Sea area. There were no distinctions between raiders and traders. One day they were plundering farmsteads and churches, the next selling those same goods at markets. One such trader was a certain Norwegian seafarer, Othera, who disclosed to King Alfred of England what the trade routes of the Viking explorers and warriors were. He described a trip to the very north of Norway and round into the Arctic Sea and down again in search of walrus tusks and seal skins. He described the market town of Kaupang in Norway and the trade routes into the Baltic Sea. Another explorer, Wulfstan of Hedeby, reported where the Vikings exchanged their goods for such wealth. The travels of Wulfstan prove the extent of the Viking web of trade between West and East. Among the places Wulfstan visited was the great city of Truso, whose remains Marek Jagodzinski found 20 years ago while riding his bike home. As I said, Truso was set up by the Scandinavian newcomers on the frontier with Baltic peoples and Slavs. The objects which we found in Truso are mainly Scandinavian, but we have ceramics, I mean clay pots, from Western Slavs, and also pots made by Baltic people, I mean Prus people. The Viking warlords dominated this Baltic trading place, turning it into a military base to supply traders and warriors on their expeditions deep into Eastern and Southern Europe. Alongside articles of daily use, Marek Jagodzinski found a large quantity of swords. Truso was a hub of the Viking web of trade and pillage. In my opinion, we see a sort of globalization. We find the same crafts, the same Arab coins, the same weights everywhere, from Britain to North Russia. 
So there was some kind of unification, and this unification was fostered by trade and craft. Here in Truso, local craftsmen worked amber, made combs, swords, jewelry, tools and weights. Slaves worked in production processes and as labor in the port. The trading emporia stretched all along the Baltic coast, from present-day Rostock to the Neva River, where St. Petersburg stands today. The Slavic peoples who inhabited this vast area lived in simple villages and used slash-and-burn agricultural techniques. They were easily dominated by the predatory Vikings. On the other hand, there is a widespread belief that the largest portion of goods exported from Eastern Europe to the Caspian Sea with the aid of the Scandinavians were slaves. It is even said that in the 10th century, the Arabian slave markets were full of slaves from Eastern Europe. The Vikings turned their military outposts into market towns, where traders paid them for protection. The Scandinavians forged new trade links between East and West. In 841, while in France the Northmen were burning down Rouen, a Scandinavian warrior, Rurik and his two brothers, founded the Kingdom of Novgorod. They were invited by the Slavic tribes of present-day Russia to give them peace and protection. The finds here, at Rurikova Garedishche, just upstream from Novgorod, show a significant Scandinavian presence. The Viking artifacts that have been found in the Novgorod area are connected both to trade and warfare. We find not only weapons, but also scales and silver in the Scandinavian graves, which suggests that the dead person was a trader. The impressive rivers and lakes of northern Russia were the heart of the early Viking conquests. Lake Ladoga is still a shipping thoroughfare, and the Volkov River flows into it, rising at Lake Ilmen 200 kilometers further south. The Sphere River in northern Russia is one of the waterways that still today connects the Caspian and Baltic seas. Weapons such as axes and swords from Novgorod and Staria Ladoga show that these were not only thriving trading centers, but also military bases. We have to say that very few Scandinavian weapons have been found in the Novgorod area, while objects to do with trade and everyday life have been found in great quantities. We should also say that Russia is crossed by many rivers. Travel was by river mainly, and the Scandinavians were traders. Fifty years after the first recorded raid against Lindisfarne, Vikings had penetrated the Eastern European river system as far as the Black Sea. Rurik's successor, Aljek, moved his headquarters down the Dnieper and seized the town of Kiev. In 907, he captured Constantinople by dragging his ships around the sea defenses. In 911, in the same year the Vikings gained Normandy as their new home in France, Aljek struck a trade deal with the Byzantine Empire, turning Kiev into the capital city of a great ruling dynasty. Part of the deal was to provide mercenaries to the emperor as his own personal bodyguard, known as the Varangian Guard. By now, half of England and much of France was ruled by the Vikings, but this was not the end of the Viking raids. Iceland sits halfway across the North Atlantic Ocean, the most dangerous sea for Vikings to cross. And yet, by accident or by design, Scandinavians landed here already in 840 AD. Later, political upheaval at home led to an exodus of refugees who opposed the rule of Harold Fairhair. The Vikings who left Norway for Iceland 
found a completely virgin land and brought their social structures with them. The owners of the largest farms were also the high priests of the community and called Gothir. Forty Gothir held an All Thing or Parliament here at the All Thing Stone every year. Here more than anywhere else, the early Viking way of life was preserved. From here, the Viking ships plowed the seas westward to Greenland, where two settlements were established. From there, they traveled as far as the American continent. For the first time, around the year 1000, the travels to the land known as Vinland was recorded by a monk who sailed with the explorer Leif Eriksson. The sagas tell us about the Viking trips to America. They are covered by the saga literature. We have to assume that there were many more voyages than described in the sagas. We have also found traces of Viking settlements in America. And there are also American Indian stories about these blue-eyed people that they met. The settlements on the American continent lasted only a few years, while the mini ice age of the 13th century onwards led to the decline of the Greenland settlements too. In Europe, the violent Viking age was reaching its climax. In Europe, the Viking invaders struck fear even more than a century after the great raids. The first millennium AD was a time of widespread violence. In 2012, 18 skeletons were found in the grounds of St. John's College, Oxford. Scholars immediately associated the find with the 1002 St. Bryce's Day Massacre, when the King of England ordered all of the Danes in his kingdom murdered. The task of identifying who these men were fell to Mark Pollard of the Forensic Archaeology Department. We first radiocarbon dated a selection of them and for various reasons the radiocarbon age wasn't exactly what we would have expected to be um, 1002 AD but there are reasons that that might be the case. So we then began to look at the carbon and nitrogen isotopes in the bone collagen which is an indicator of diet. Um, and we also looked at the strontium and oxygen isotopes in the dental enamel from the teeth um, because that gives you some indication of where those individuals uh, grew up. The skeletons from Oxford suffered a similar fate to another group found near the seaside town of Weymouth. Were they Vikings? Yeah, we matched them with the, the Vikings that had been recovered from Weymouth. They're roughly contemporary from the radiocarbon dates and um, other people had done strontium and oxygen in their teeth and they found the same pattern that we found, not from the south of England. And actually on the diagram they're moving in a direction which suggests both an older geology, which is consistent with possibly Scandinavia, um, and also a, a colder climate, which is also consistent with Scandinavia. While strontium isotope techniques suggested the victims were not from the south of England, possibly from Danelaw therefore, other marks hinted at their true identity. Several of the skeletons showed healed wounds which may plausibly have come from blade wounds. And so I think, you know, in, in a group of 16 to 25 year old males, if they're carrying um, healed blade wounds, then the chances are they've been in combat conflict um, before. So I think they're, 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 you know, they're not sort of a group of people who were farmers and, and just sort of happened to be passing by. I think they are either professionals, mercenaries or, or raiders of some description. The beginning of the 11th century was a violent time and national identities were less important than local and family ties. It's quite complicated to understand what identity would have meant at that time. I think, you know, we tend to use these titles of these are Danes and those are Anglo-Saxons, but all of this identity is a, a sort of a created identity, whether they are 
when we say they're Danes, whether they're people who come from Denmark or whether they might be second or third generation people born in Britain um, but of originally Danish stock and perhaps uh, holding to Danish customs and practices, possibly uh, dressing more like Danes than Anglo-Saxons. It's very difficult to know. Far to the north, in York, another victim of murder was found buried under the Coppergate streets. This skeleton shows multiple blade wounds, but knowing why this young man died is almost impossible. Why was the person killed? Obviously, we'll never know. It, was, it looks like it was violent, um, and um, you can tell that through the osteology. But if you were to try and pinpoint me down to see why can we, can we bring that to an event, I, I honestly can't say. We, we can, but what we need to bear in mind is that what this person represents is um, a, a bloody and violent end to somebody's life, still in an era, in an era sorry, when a lot of this um, is going on. Although the legend of the violent Viking lives on, the true nature of their society may be different from what scholars have written for centuries. What archaeology is very good at is breaking down this idea that the Vikings are compartmentalised, the Anglo-Saxon world is compartmentalised, the, 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 the Picts and the Celts are compartmentalised, and actually we start to bring that bleeding of the edges together and we start to see a lot more complex society um, where people can define themselves. People obviously go to war about definition and power, um, but at the same time we get that, that input of continental imported goods, we see goods from Britain going abroad, and it just brings together, I think, we make it a rich tapestry. Perhaps the most daring of all raids left Sweden for the furthest eastern edge of the Viking world. Around 1040 AD, Ingvar the far-travelled and a small army of a thousand men left central Sweden for Russia and then on to present-day Georgia then under Arab influence, where they won a decisive battle. The land ruled by Saracens was known as Sarkland. They may have crossed the Caspian Sea and reached Tashkent, but only one of the many ships returned home. 26 rune stones in Sweden commemorate the men who traveled with Ingvar, but most touching of all is this one now standing in the grounds of Gripsholm Castle on Lake Malaren. It tells the tale of Ingvar's brother. Tolla had this stone raised in memory of her son, Haralder, Ingvar's brother. They traveled valiantly far for gold and in the east gave food to the eagle. They died in the south in Sirkland. Ingvar may have been of royal blood, and his family were among the leaders of the international Viking elite who still led their warriors into battle 250 years after the raid on Lindisfarne. The most persistent myth about the Vikings is that they were thieves, they were pirates, they were great warriors, they always won all the battles, they were brave, they didn't fear death and so on. But the truth is, that they weren't better or worse than others at that time. They did live in a violent time. The year 1000 was a turning point in the story of the Vikings. The era of the early raids was over and Viking expansion had reached its high tide mark. But it was also the beginning of a century of even more bloodshed. The freebooting Viking chieftains faded away, and in their place, great Viking overlords, kings of whole countries who unleashed the power of Viking armies against England and against each other, spilt more blood than at any time in the preceding centuries. Rich, professional mercenary forces dominated Eastern and Western Europe. Their leaders learned the craft of kingship from their enemies, and built states that are still with us today.